Hello, Andrew Wolf here. In this video, I'm going to talk about diabetic nephropathy. Now, in the last video, we talked a lot about, when we talked about hypertensive nephropathy, we talked a lot about how the glomerulus of the kidney is exposed to very high pressures. And of course, this is an adaption to allow the kidneys to make an ultrafiltrate. Under pressure, we are um, extruding extruding plasma from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule which goes into the renal tubule. Now one of the adaptations that allows our glomerulus to withstand those pressures is the fact that we tightly regulate those pressures by vasoconstricting and vasodilating the arterioles on both sides of, glom of the glomerulus. So again you know, having um, smooth muscles and the arterioles on both sides of the glomerulus allows the kidneys to have exquisite control and provide a very narrow range of pressures within the glomerulus between like 50 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Whereas systemically, you know, the range of pressures between um, within the systemic capillaries is going to be much much wider. Now I want to introduce now another adaptation that the body that the kidneys have that the glomerulus has to withstand these very high intracapillary pressures and this is called the mesangium. The mesangium is a collection of cells or a small bit of tissue that sort of lays in the middle of the glomerulus, the tuft of capillaries, and it provides some structure. Now these cells are actually part of the capillary structure, so if you kind of look at an end-on view of the capillaries, what you'll see is, you know, on the inside you'll have your endothelial cells, and then, well this basement the red will pretend as a basement membrane, although it's much thicker than it would be. And then, you know, obviously we have our podocytes on the outside. And so there's our little podocyte there. And then sort of off to the side, if you can imagine that we're coming sort of looking at the middle of, of the tuft of capillaries here, we have some mesangial cells. Now these mesangial cells are actually relatively closely related to, they have the same lineage as smooth muscle cells, but they aren't smooth muscle cells, they don't have any contractile components, no actin and myosin, so these are mesangial cells. and this section here is called the mesangium. Actually, to be more specific, this is called the intraglomerular mesangium because there is actually another mesangium that is outside the glomerulus that is part of the juxtamedullary apparatus. And they're similar cells, but they have a different function. So the intra, we're talking here about the intraglomerular mesangium. So what do these cells do? Well, one thing that these cells do is they actually create this collagen network that holds all the capillaries in place. And one of the things that these cells can do is they can actually cause this network of collagen fibers to to cons could to sort of constrict or dilate so they can pull the um, glomerulus tighter together or allow it to spread out and this seems to cause um, changes in the fenestra so the mesangial cells can sort of allow more filtration or less filtration by um, constricting or dilating also the mesangial cells are have the ability to secrete cytokines 
in reaction in to sort of stimulate inflammation in reaction to injury or other chemical mediators. So they play an important role in, in sort of a central role of the immune system within the glomerulus. Okay, so that explains the normal functioning of the mesangium, the mesangial cells. Now, the mesangial cells play a very central role in the pathogenesis of diabetic nephropathy. So, what we know is that these mesangial cells are going to respond in diabetic nephropathy, respond to sort of two inputs. One is increased pressure and barotrauma. And the other is injury from the free radicals that are released due to high BGs, high blood glucose. So everybody knows why we, we talked quite a bit about diabetes and everyone's got knowledge about why diabetics have high blood glucose, but why do diabetics have high glomerular pressures? Well, of course, one reason is many diabetics have hypertension. It's, it's part of metabolic syndrome and they often coexist. But the other reason is many diabetics have high insulin levels particularly type 2 diabetics that um, still have a functioning pancreas, they're trying to um, make up for the increased uh, for the insulin resistance and the increased blood glucose levels in their body by um, causing by increasing the amount of insulin. So they have hyperinsulinemia. So insulin is one hyperinsulinemia is one factor. And there's a number of other hormones and chemicals involved here. But suffice it to say that even if a diabetic has normal systemic pressure, they oftentimes will have hypertension in the glomerulus because many of these mediators, like insulin, some other hormones, and some cytokines, angiotensin is one of the central ones, causes vasoconstriction of the efferent arterioles and that raises intraglomerular pressure. Okay, so this is increased intraglomerular pressure. So we have barotrauma or free radicals that are causing stress to this mesangial cell. The mesangial cell is going to react in a couple of ways. First of all, it's going to release cytokines, and that's going to cause inflammation. And second of all, the cells are going to stimulate a hypertrophy of the mesangium, otherwise known as, if you read in the literature, you'll often come across the term mesangial expansion. And this is, you know, essentially hypertrophy of the mesangium, where we have cells that are larger and more and greater in number. Now these two factors are going to combine together to stimulate the mesangial cell to start to create an increased mesangial ma matrix. Remember the mesangial matrix is this matrix that the mesangium creates around itself that holds the capillaries together. So it's going to thicken this matrix, right? And what is this matrix made out of? Well, fibrin, collagen. Now, with increased fibrin and collagen within the glomerulus, we're going to start to have glomerular atrophy and dysfunction. 
Okay, the glomerulus will eventually become completely useless, and Bowman's capsule will be filled with fibrin and collagen and no longer be capable of filtering and beginning the process of um, creating urine. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the stages of diabetic nephropathy. So the first stage is actually a stage with increased glomerular filtration rate. So why does this happen? Well, we have increased pressures here due to the insulin and other hormones and cytokines causing efferent arterial or vasoconstriction. And this increases the blood, the pressure, intraglomerular pressure, and that increases filtration pressure, right? That's due to increased filtration pressure. So with an increased glomerular filtration rate, things actually look really good because we have a really low creatinine, we're making plenty of urine. However, this is still, this is due to the early stage of the disease. Okay, so that's related to increased pressure. Now the second stage of the disease is when we have detectable proteinuria. And this is due to that uh, mesangial expansion and the increase in the matrix, the beginning of that process, because we are actually pulling on the collagen fibers that hold the capillaries together and that actually increases the pore size so we end up begin to have protein leaking out in larger amounts into the filtrate. Now the third stage is microhematuria. What is this due to? Well, this is due to injury to the tubules. The injury to the tubules is caused by ischemia because as we have collagen and fibrin um, deposited into the glomerulus, we begin to constrict the blood flow through the glomerulus and this decreases the blood flow through the efferent arteriole. And where does the efferent arteriole go? Well, the efferent arteriole is the blood supply for the tubules. Okay, so the hematuria is a sign that the tubules are becoming ischemic. So this is the, the disease is beginning to become more advanced. Then as the process continues and we're impact, we, we have nephrons beginning to die in significant numbers, we will begin to notice a decreased glomerular filtration rate. Remember, we started out with actually an increased glomerular filtration rate, but now we've gotten to the point where the nephrons are dying and we have a decreased glomerular filtration rate. And then, of course, the last stage is going to be end-stage renal disease when we have, um, when we have so few nephrons that we no longer can um, maintain the major functions of the kidney. Okay, so I wanted to point out a few differences between diabetic nephropathy and hypertensive nephropathy. Um, the major difference is the way that they begin. Remember, hypertensive nephropathy begins with disease in the afferent arteriole, whereas diabetic nephropathy really is related to disease in the mesangium. So this impacts the way that the disease progresses. Now diabetic nephropathy passes through all of these stages. Um, hypertensive nephropathy will actually start with a phase of increased glomerular filtration rate and that is due to um, a pressure natriuresis from um, or a pressure diuresis from the increased filtration pressures because of the high transmitted pressures into the glomerulus. However, hypertensive nephropathy will not pass through a uh, phase of proteinuria generally because this is due to the contraction of the mesangial cells that sort of open up the pores inside the glomerulus. Um, 
the last three here, three through five, are shared in common because hematuria is due to the injury to the tubules and decreased glomerular fil filtration rate and the eventual development of end-stage renal disease is due to loss of nephrons, which both of these disease ha diseases have in common. Okay, so that brings my discussion about diabetic nephropathy to an end. Please, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below, and I will answer them if I'm able to. And as always, you um, are encouraged to provide feedback by giving me a thumbs up if you liked, enjoyed this video or found it useful. And I'm also providing a couple of links so that you have quick and easy access to my other physiology and pathophysiology videos. Thank you very much.